welcome to Grace Community Fellowship. Hey, if you're uh, new to the church, my name is John Green, and I'm the worship pastor here at Grace. And uh, I've been here 18 years. My wife, Amy, grew up here at Grace, and I've got three kids that are all middle schoolers. Um, well, I guess officially, like, two of them are high schoolers now, but they're all middle schoolers still, as far as I'm concerned. Um, happy Memorial Day weekend. Hey, this is a, a special weekend in our country where we uh, remember those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedoms. So before we move on with our service today, here's what I want to do. I want to just take a moment and reflect uh, as, a, as a church body on the fact that we have so much privilege to live where we live. And specifically, I want to pray, I want you to take a moment and pray quietly for Christians, for your brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world who do not enjoy the freedoms that you enjoy. And uh, today, uh, I read the news this morning that, uh, so we, uh, as a church, we, we help a church in Myanmar who they've been going through uh, terrible political difficulty and now there's a giant COVID outbreak in Myanmar and they don't have the hospitals. And because of the, the military conflict, all of their infrastructure is broken. And so there's lots of problems there. So um, specifically pray for our brothers and sisters in Myanmar that we have helped support, but pray for Christians all over the world that um, do not enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy here in the United States of America as the body of Christ. So we're just going to take a moment and quietly reflect and pray for the church. God, thank you for the blessing of living where we live in the United States of America. God, we pray for your church, for your body all over the world. We pray for persecuted Christians and for Christians living in uh, very difficult circumstances. That, God, that you would strengthen them. God, we thank you for the families in our country who have sacrificed, uh, who have sacrificed blood for, to preserve the freedoms that we have here in our country. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, man, it has been a crazy year. Um, reflecting on like coronavirus and all of these things, and uh, there's been a lot of tension and a lot of uh, pain. Lots of families have lost loved ones. There's also been some pretty silly things. Uh, with coronavirus. So today I wanted to like move on a little bit as we uh, start to anticipate the, um, the end of mask mandates and all of these sorts of things. I want to just reflect on some of the, the lighter things that have come with COVID. So uh, something that was really popular to do during the, when the lockdown started, people started new hobbies. So raise your hand if you started working in your yard more during COVID. Nobody? Nobody started working in your yard more? Okay, a few, a few people. All right. Raise your hand if you started learning to bake with sourdough during the sourdough starter fad. Anybody? All right. Um, raise your hand if you went for at least a month without a haircut. Okay, wait. Keep them up. Keep them up. Two months without a haircut. Hashtag COVID cut, right? Three months without a haircut. Four months without a haircut. Five, oh man, okay. Good job, folks. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you started looking for masks that would match your wardrobe. All right. Raise your hand if you started making masks that would match your wardrobe. Ah, making custom masks. You know Standing up here, so we just went camping like overnight over at the coast. And so I still have, I still smell like campfire. And uh, I was, I had the idea last night. I was like, man, I have not seen any scented masks. Could you imagine the last year, like, maybe we'll have another year. Maybe we'll go for a scented mask business. All right, um, raise your hand if you downloaded or 
decorated a room in your house, if you downloaded a custom Zoom background or decorated a room in your house for Zoom meetings? Yeah, oh, some of the teachers in here raising their hand. All right. This has been a crazy year, and lots of people tried new things. Lots of people tried exercise programs and all kinds of things that they hadn't done before. Um, In our family, we tried to, uh, over the last year, we tried to look at this time as a time of opportunity. Opportunity is to start new things. So we started a few new habits as a family. One of those was to take a family walk every night. And uh, that was easy to do before schedules started getting back into the swing of things. But now we, we are still doing that. As, as we have a free evening, we take a family walk around the block. It's about a mile to go around our neighborhood. And, and that's been an excellent time just to touch base together as a family and to enjoy each other's company, even if everybody's not feeling up for it. Another thing we started to do is we started reading through the Bible together. Uh, So we started with Genesis 1, and we haven't done it every night, but we've been consistent. And right now we're in, we're in 2 Kings right now, uh, going through the Bible. And one of my favorite things about reading through the Bible with my kids like that is um, being middle schoolers, all of them have like grown up hearing versions of Bible stories from the Old Testament, but then you go and you read them, and the best comment is like, whoa, that was not in the version I learned. Um, And there are all kinds of those things, right? You don't hear about certain things. You don't hear about, uh, one of my favorites is uh, Ehud the, the judge in the book of Judge. Who knows about Ehud? Oh, yeah. Ehud's an assassin, who stabs a guy, uh, the, a Moabite king, who's so large that the dagger and part of his arm disappear into the stomach, and then he has to yank him out to, to disappear to flee. How many of you knew that story? Did you know that? Another one, one of my really favorite ones uh, that still sticks out to me, and it's applicable for today, is uh, I had forgotten that when God gives the instructions for the tabernacle in the, old, in the book of Exodus and in the book of <sighs> Leviticus, that uh, one of the things in the tabernacle, in the holy place, next to the holy of holies where God's presence is, is a table with bread and wine on it. Uh, and I love the way that, that here we have in the Old Testament this thing where in God's presence is bread and wine. And as uh, we'll talk about that later today in the sermon as we talk about taking communion together and this idea of God's presence and bread and wine together. But one of the things that sticks out with this idea of things in the Old Testament that we've forgotten or maybe haven't read or we skipped over because it's like one sentence long, that comes up in our passage in 2 Corinthians today. So we as a church have been going through 2 Corinthians, and here we are today in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. And if you uh, have a Bible or a tablet or a thing, you can get it out and follow along for yourself, or you can read it on the screen. 1 Corinthians, we're just going to read it and kind of talk through it as we go. And then we'll uh, look at what can we take away from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in this passage. So here we go. That old way with laws etched in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. 
But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So what is Paul talking about with all of this, like, old way, new way, all of this stuff? Well, Paul is talking about uh, a passage in Exodus chapter 34. And Exodus chapter 34, we're just going to read the end of this passage. But it says, When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak to the Lord, he removed the veil until he came out again. Then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him, and the people would see his face aglow. Afterward, man, there were lots of typos when I typed that in. Afterward, he would put the veil on again until he returned to speak with the Lord. So this is one of those passages. I think everybody knows about Moses going up to the mountain, speaking with God, getting the Ten Commandments, coming down. There's a, there's a golden calf that the Israelites had made. How many of you knew that part of the story? Yeah, but did you know that Moses smashes the tablet, goes back up on the mountain, gets a second ta- group of tablets, and then comes back again, and his face is glowing? Raise your hand if you knew that part. Yeah, right? That's not as many people. So there are always these things that we skip over. And so what is this talking about? Well, this is talking about how the, the presence of God's spirit is important in the Old Testament. The, we have this situation where God's presence is so great and so massive that Moses can't even bear to look at God. And he hides behind a rock and God passes by him. And, but then we see that we're in the camp of the Israelites, and when they make the tabernacle, God's presence comes down in pillars of smoke and fire so that all of the people can see God's presence. And, and in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, God's spirit being with the people is important. But God gives, and God gives the law, but Paul is saying that the law is old. It's passing away. But the new covenant, the new presence of God is, is eternal. It's not passing away. So what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is that my hope comes from the Spirit. My hope comes from the Spirit of God. So in the Old Testament, when we read through the Old Testament, we see that Israel is hopeless without God's presence. Anytime they try to go into battle without God's presence, they lose. Anytime they worship another god, God's presence leaves them. And we, we read in the Psalms lots of times where the psalmist says, Keep, stay close to me, give me your presence, God. So just like Israel, I only have hope when the Lord is present with me. But God's presence with us is not the same as the Old Testament. And that's an important thing for us to remember. We often live in such a way that God's presence can leave us. That God's presence is not with us. We come into church services and there are prayers, God, let your presence be here. But what Paul is saying in this this chapter is that when we turn to Jesus, in verse 16, when when those who turn to the Lord, the veil is lifted, God's presence is with us. And it's an eternal presence. This is all through the New Testament. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, the veil in the temple that separates the the presence of God from the people, that veil is torn. Jesus' name means God with us. Jesus is Emmanuel. God is with us. So when we... Uh, turn to Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. We see this in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says, when you receive the Lord, the Holy Spirit is a seal on your heart, a promise of your salvation. 
In 1 Corinthians, Paul refers to us as a body of people, a group of people who are the, the hands and feet, the body of Christ. God's presence is with us. In 1 Peter, Peter refers to us as living stones that are making up a temple of God where the sacrifices will be, will be offered. That there is no longer a place where God's presence exists, that, like a temple, but, but rather that we are the place where God's presence exists. When you trust in Christ, you have God's presence in you. And so Paul is saying here that, if the old way was awesome, God met with Israel. God went to the tent of meeting. He led them through the desert. There are miracles and seas parting and fire and smoke and all these crazy things going on. And God personally writes down what he wants for Israel to do. And he gives them the distinguishment. And he says, if you follow this, I will be with you. And I will bless you and you'll be a light to the nations. That was awesome. But it's gone. How much more awesome is this new way that God is with us all the time. That the, the Holy Spirit is in our hearts when we turn to Christ. When we trust Jesus and we allow God's presence to enter us. So that's the first thing. My hope comes from the Spirit. The second thing is my freedom is dependent on the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now this isn't a general sort of thing. There's freedom everywhere because God is everywhere. This is, there is freedom where the Lord is present. But freedom from what? I think this is a great passage to think about on Memorial Day weekend. Because I think we as Americans, as people who've been raised in the United States of America, are well-versed in constitutional freedoms and the sovereignty of man and liberty from the government and the preservation of liberty and all these sorts of things. But that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about your freedom as an American. This is not talking about my freedom as an individual. This is not talking about any of that. What are we free from? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Well, what we are free from, Paul is talking about in this passage. We are free from the old way. We are free from the necessity of sacrifice. Paul makes the comment in this passage, he makes it in Romans, he makes it in several other places, that the law represents the condemnation and death of us. The law leads us to death. And when we have God's presence with us, we are free from that law. We are free from the duty of sacrifice because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are free from the duty of the law because of the grace of God. We don't have to earn it anymore. God's not mad at us. God's not going to leave us or forsake us, just as Jesus says. We are free. Just let that sink in for a second. Because often, we do not live as though we are free. We do one of two things. One, we, we don't live as we're free. We live as though we still have to earn it. I still have to earn God's favor. I still have to earn God's love. I still have to earn it. I still have to sacrifice for God. Or the other way that we live is that we abuse that freedom. Just as Paul says in Romans, if grace abounds, should I sin so that I'll get more grace? Or in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, everything is lawful for me, but not everything is profitable. I'm free to do lots of stuff now. I don't have to follow the rules. But that doesn't mean I should do those things. 
We abuse our freedom. We begin to believe that our freedom is about us. And both of those are wrong. We don't have to earn it. The sacrifice is already made. But we also can't abuse it. Every time we see in the Old Testament and in the New, in Revelation, we see people exposed to God's presence, they all have the same response. And it's not throw a party. And it's not stand there and go, man, I'm awesome, I'm free. It's face to the ground, bended knee, I am not worthy of this. And I think maybe too often we as Christians don't have that attitude. I am not worthy of God's grace. God is holy, and I am not. God is sovereign, and I am not. The third point, my nature is transformed by the Spirit to be more like Christ. Paul says that we are transformed and we look as though in a mirror and we're transformed into that image, at the, at the image of God, the image of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, I think that means I need to, can I look in the mirror today and say, I look, I think I look more like Jesus today. Do I look more like Jesus today than I used to? Do I look more like Jesus or do I look like something else? Do I look like a conservative evangelical? Or do I look like fill in the blank? Or do I look like Jesus? Jesus said we must die to ourselves. Paul in Romans 12 says that we must allow God to transform and renew our minds. How do we do this? I'm transformed when I pursue God's word. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is my food. Man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. These are all things that are repeated all through the scripture, that God's word is what I need to transform. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who meditates on God's word. He's like a tree planted by a river with deep roots. When I run to God's word, God uses, he speaks into my life and transforms my heart and mind to be more like Jesus. In John, in the gospel of John, we learn that Jesus himself is God's word. He is God's final word on what it looks like to be godly. So I'm transformed when I pursue God's word. I'm transformed when I pursue God's presence. Several years ago, we as a church participated in a study, um, a survey-based study about um, spiritual growth and how people grow in their, li- in their spiritual lives. And we, there are things that you learn in that. And, and one of them was that lots of people don't read their Bibles. Lots of people don't p- pursue God's word. Another is that people do not Um, lots of people pray for other people. But lots of people do not pray for forgiveness or for guidance. Or they don't pray for God's, they don't listen for God's guidance in their lives when they pray. And I would encourage you today that we are transformed when we pursue God's presence, when, we, when our prayer life becomes about seeking God's guidance, confessing our sin, asking God for help in our lives, pursuing God's presence. Just like we read, we read in Exodus when Moses goes into the presence of God or later when David goes and sits in the tabernacle with, 
with the, with the Ark of the Covenant and sits in God's presence. We pursue God's presence. When we make that a part of our lives, God transforms us with his presence in our lives. Because part of God's presence is that we become aware, just like Isaiah and just like Moses, we become aware of our sin. We become aware of, of how we're not worthy of God's presence, how we're not worthy of what God is giving us. So the third thing, we are transformed when we listen to God's convicting. When God convicts us and we obey and we repent, and we do that repeatedly, God transforms us. Often, we, we fail to listen to that convicting. We come and we sit in church, and we listen to God's word, and then Monday the schedule starts again. And it's not that we deliberately ignore God's voice, but it's not a part of our lives, and we've got a schedule to keep. And so things get out of hand. I would challenge you today, I, I would hope that as you go from here today that you think about how can I pursue God's word? How can I pursue God's presence? God, give me a soft heart that listens to your conviction. Give me a repentant heart. So today, as we, uh, as we read this passage, I have two challenges for you. We read about Moses. Uh, we, we've seen how in Moses, uh, we know the story. Moses goes up onto the mountaintop and he experiences God's presence and he comes back down and there's awful stuff happening. And he goes back up onto the mountaintop and he experiences God's presence. I think a lot of us have these mountaintop experiences in our lives where we experience God's presence. Maybe for you that was when you became a believer, when you accepted Christ. Maybe that's a memory of some, you, some camp or retreat, or maybe that's in some Bible study that you participate in where you had this aha moment and you became aware of God's presence with you. For me, I have one. I was at... Uh, I was at youth camp. I was 18 years old, and uh, I, I suddenly, I was like, I cannot stand up. I have to sit down. Uh, and I was listening. Uh, we were singing the songs, and, you know, it, it was camp songs, you know, like, Stuff like that, right? And, and all of a sudden, I was like, man, I have to sit down. I could not stand. And I just started weeping. And I, I knew in that moment that God had something to say to me. So I stayed there uh, for like an hour. Um, and I knew coming out of that evening, uh, I the following weekend, I went, we went back home. I knew that God was calling me to, uh, to a life of ministry, that God wanted me to serve as a pastor in, in some way, in some form. So I came home from camp that following Sunday. I walked the aisle at my church during the altar call, and I made a public declaration that I was going to follow God and his call into ministry. But I knew in that moment that it was God's presence. A few years later, I was in a seminar at a conference, and I was listening. I was 19. So I guess it wasn't a few years later. I was 19, and I was sitting in a conference. I went to this, like, presentation about, 
about how the Southern Baptist Convention, because uh, I grew up Southern Baptist, how the Southern Baptist Convention was going to approach the uh, Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia um, the following summer. And I, I knew I was going to be in Atlanta. I can't explain it, how I knew, but I knew. And I went through the whole application process, and I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and there are some other details there that it was a very much a confirmed thing for me that God had called me there. So maybe you have memories like that. Maybe you don't. Sometimes people, uh, people don't have those memories. But, but I think if we think back in our lives, many of us, whether it's uh, some experience in God's created world, if it's, maybe it's some experience in a Bible study or at a camp or at a retreat where you've been aware of God's presence. My challenge to you in those moments as you think of those is to, is to not let that fade. We read here that Moses comes down from the mountain, his face is aglow, right? Many of us have had that experience of the proverbial face aglow. And Moses, because his face is glowing, he puts a veil on to cover it from the people of Israel so that they are not threatened or scared. Because, but Paul says because their hearts, their hearts were hard. Don't let your glowing face fade. Seek God's presence. Seek God's presence so that you are continually in God's presence. So that your Mountaintop experiences, don't fade away from your memory. Don't let the mundane, ordinary parts of life take away from God's glory in your life. The second thing would be to stop settling for wearing veils. Paul says when we trust Christ, the veil is taken away. But I think a lot of times we just like put on veils like masks. And maybe we make our own little veils that we like to put on. And we put veils on, things that obscure our view of God's glory. Things that become distractions from seeing God's presence for what it is. There's a whole list of common ones. I don't think I need to list them. But don't settle. Stop putting on veils. Stop putting on distractions from God's presence. C.S. Lewis, uh, there's a quote that I love from C.S. Lewis when he's talking about, uh, you know, in one of his writings called The Four Loves, and he's talking about when we, like, seek relationships from other people and we seek lots of things, and it says this. This is the quote. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I think that echoes what Paul is saying here, that the, the newness of the presence of God, the Spirit's presence in our lives is immeasurably glorious. Compared to all of the fading and temporary things that we busy ourselves with, God's Spirit is eternally glorious and just like Jesus says, don't, don't worry about treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy and decay it, but store up treasure in heaven. Set your mind on eternal things, on things of God. Don't allow yourself to be too easily pleased with temporary things. <laughs> 